I hesitate to even start in uh, on what I studied tonight or for tonight. I think it may be better for another time. Just ask you to think about the message that we brought this morning for you, those of you who are here about the humility of God and what that means to us and that view of God. You know, we started out in John chapter 17, verse 3, and this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the one true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. And then we went over to Job 42, verses 5 and 6. I had heard of thee in the hearing of my ear, Job said, but now, but now my eye has seen thee. Wherefore, I repent. I abhor myself, Job said. Wherefore, I abhor. Because I have seen you, God, because I have come to a place of understanding, because I have got it out of my head and into my heart, who you are, and because you have revealed to me your grace, because you have revealed to me my relation to you. See, all of Job's interaction with God before, he was standing there almost arguing with God, but this interaction here was interaction of total submission. He had come to a place where he had submitted himself to God. He understood that God was far and above and way too beyond his ability to really grasp the purposes of God. We need to take that lesson to heart. There's a lot of things we go through. And why do we have to go through this, Lord? Why are you letting this happen? And of course, we've always got some friends there that will remind us it's the result and the consequences of sin that you're going through these things. Yeah, there's always people, somebody's going to stand up and say, now what's going on or what's happening in your life? You know, if you hadn't done this, if you hadn't done that, maybe you wouldn't have ended up here. Job got caught up in defending himself. Job got caught up in defending his own righteousness, defending his own goodness and his justness. Job got so caught up in it that he began to question God began to defend his own righteousness before God. Amen. It happens to us if we're not careful. If we're not careful, it can happen to you and I. Thank God. Every now and then we come to a better understanding and a better, better revelation and a better picture of who God truly is and our insignificance in relation to Him. Did you know that? You are insignificant. I am insignificant. The only significance that I have is through Jesus Christ. The only significance that I have or you have is because God loved you. And because God redeemed you, that is the only reason that you are significant whatsoever. Otherwise, you are totally insignificant. But it's because of His love, because of His grace, because of His mercy that we have any significance whatsoever. I have been reminded of that vividly this week as I've studied for this message that I preached this morning. I don't know if I got my point across or not, but i tell you what, God got it across to me. Whether or not I was able to get it across to you, I don't know. But he sure preached it to me. <laughs> and he got it across to me. The point that any significance that I might have is only found in him his great mercy and his great love and his great plan. And since we're not going to go with the, the thoughts that I had studied, I'd ask you to turn over to Romans chapter 12. And I just want to read the first two verses of Romans chapter 12. And 
And here Paul says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. In light of what we heard this morning, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That's the whole purpose of our willingly submitting. That's the whole purpose of us being a living sacrifice, that we may prove what is that good and acceptable will of God. When we read this, I know a lot of people read this passage of Scripture and they like to string out all kinds of doctrines, they like to build all kinds of doctrines, but I think sometimes we need to read that passage of Scripture in its context. Remember where it's written in Romans. Paul had just got through a discourse all about the Jews, chapter 9, chapter 10, chapter 11. He is talking all about the Jews and how that he wished that they could come to salvation. He wished that he could die so that they might be saved. And he comes on down, he talks about them being regrafted back in. How we were grafted in. The wild olive branch. And he speaks to the wild olive branch in chapter 12, verse 1. He said, therefore, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, because the Jews have been cut off, because the Jews need to be saved, because you who are a wild olive branch, because you have been grafted in, I beseech you, therefore, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice unto God. Why? That you may prove what is that good and acceptable will of God. You know what? When you go out of this place tonight, tomorrow, next week, your job, present your body. Just like Jesus Christ did. What did Jesus Christ do? He presented His body. He presented His body a living sacrifice. What? That He might prove the perfect will of God. What was God's will? That all men be saved. And he proved, he gave himself a living sacrifice that all men could be saved. And Paul says, in light of that, and in light of where the Jews are today, you present your bodies. And I say to you, in light of where your families are today, where your children are, your grandchildren, your great-grandkids, your mom, your dad, whoever, I don't care, in light of where they are, I beseech you, therefore, that you present your bodies. Present your daily activities. Present your life. Present your words. Present your actions. A living sacrifice. That you may be able to prove what is that good, perfect will of God. You know what? It works. It works. I would like to think that I had some small part. My living sacrifice of my body had some small part in this morning when he bowed me sitting there in that chair. Amen. That blessed my soul. I couldn't believe it when Sister Kathy said, Wayne's here. I said, what? One sows, one waters, and another man reaps. I'm just a donkey. <laughs> I'm just a donkey. But I thank God that we see some evidence of presenting your bodies a living sacrifice. I'll be honest with you, as your pastor, sometimes you get phone calls, you get all this stuff. I mean, you wouldn't believe it. Sometimes you don't feel like going. But God didn't ask me how I felt. He said, go. God didn't care what I had on my schedule. He said, go. 
That's what Paul is talking about there. Present your body a living sacrifice. Now I know there's lots of doctrines that like to be built off of that, bought, built off of that, sanctification and all that good stuff. But look at it in its context. Look at it in its context of where it's written in the book of Romans and what he had just been talking about. The word therefore, every time that we see that, we need to go back and figure out what it's there for. And if we do that, we find Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11. The need of salvation for all these people in the world. I don't have any notes whatsoever. I kind of abandoned my notes. Amen. Amen. God is so good. Amen. You're not interrupting me. I wasn't saying anything. <laughs> I'm sorry. Somebody says you need the mic. No, you're fine, bro. But I, I, I have been in church for a long time, and I've seen people saved and everything, and when something bad happens, they run right out of the church. It's so neat to see my mom and me Staying with God because things are happening fast, quick. My mom could run far away and blame God. But thank God, God's got us in his hand, holding yeah. us. And like this message, I did not understand it this morning. Told Bernie, I don't even know why. I, and here you are. God says, this guy needs it. So you can go through it again. Amen. God is so good. He speaks to me like that. I mean, it, I just get chills, and it's wonderful. I love it. Thank God God brung me in where I need to be because I could be in prison or dead. He loved me enough to bring me. Amen. God bless you. That's really kind of all the thoughts that I had tonight. I don't know if you want to add something to it, if you have a thought you would like to add. But I'm going to read that one more time. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I, in my personal studies a number of times, have read that verse, or those two verses, just the way I read them a few seconds ago. Uh, leaving out the middle part. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That is the purpose of presenting your body. It's not so that you can polish the outside. It's not so you can get exalted and high and lifted up. That is totally contradictory to what God is, totally contradictory to what Christ is and what the Christian walk is. 
It's not so that you can get up here on some high plane. But it's so that you can become meek and lowly like our God like our Savior, Jesus Christ. I leave the simple thoughts with you this evening. I just, I didn't feel that we should move over into Daniel. I did some studying on the story of Belshazzar. Because Belshazzar had a, had a problem with pride and arrogance. And it cost him. Amen, it cost him. It come right in the middle of his celebrating. It come right in the middle of his uh, partying and rioting. And it grabbed him right by the heart. But by that time it was done. It was too late. It was all finished. It was just a matter of hours before he would lose his life and lose his kingdom. Pride is an awful thing. And it needs to be eradicated in the life of a Christian. Amen. The third verse of Romans 12. Would you like to read it? You read it. <laughs> Romans 12 and 3. For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of great faith. Amen. Not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. If we'll all... Praise the Lord. I like this, um, this style. Different thoughts coming from different places. This is good. This is from the Message Bible, Romans 12, 1 through 3. So, here's what I want you to do. God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life. You're sleeping, eating, going to work and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you in the best thing is the best thing you can do for Him. Listen to that. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for Him. Don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into, fit into it even with, without even thinking. I'm sorry, I botched that up. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what He wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always, drag you down, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. I am speaking to you out of deep gratitude for all that God has given me, and especially as I have responsibilities in relation to you. Living then, as every one of you does, in pure grace, it is important that you not misinterpret yourselves as people who are bringing this goodness to God. No, no. It is God who brings it all to you. The only accurate way to understand ourselves is by what God is and by what God does for us, not, not by what we are and what we do for Him. Isn't that beautiful? The only accurate way to understand ourselves is by what God is and by what He does for us not by what we are or what we do for Him. I love all the different translations. I have several on my desk at home. Thank you, sister. One of them that I've 
really gleaned a lot out of is the New Living Translation. I enjoy that quite a bit. I always look to it anytime that I'm meditating and chewing on something from the King James and I want a little bit more, I go over and I look at the New Living Translation. And then I pull up my computer and uh, look at several other translations sometimes. Look at different commentaries, Adam Clark's commentary, McLaren, um, Matthew Henry's commentary. I look at that quite a bit. But there's nothing like the Spirit of God speaking to your heart, revealing truth to your heart. That's the best commentary on the Bible, is the Holy Spirit. And surprisingly enough, that's where uh, most of the message come from this morning. I wasn't able to find many references to the humility of God. You can find lots of references to the humility of Jesus Christ. You can find all kinds of scriptures, but there seems to be this disconnect where people set Jesus over here, but God's over here. But in my Bible, they're the same. They're two, they're three persons, but they're joined. They're three in one. Amen. You cannot separate them. You cannot separate the characteristics of one from the other. What a beautiful thought. I leave the thoughts with you this evening. I pray that God will bless you. Those of you maybe who weren't here, if you'd like to grab the, the CD or a DVD from this morning, I think you will find it interesting, challenging. Maybe, as Brother Jamie says, you won't understand it, but in light of what we have talked about this evening, I pray that you will um, be spiritually edified. Amen. Any other thoughts tonight? Anything you'd like to add? Testimonies? Songs? Anybody want to preach? The offer's out there. In fact, I need a volunteer for Wednesday night. Can I see the hands? Praise the Lord. That was quick. Thank you, sister. I appreciate that. Thank God. Brother Jamie's got another thought. You know how you say greed or how do you say greed or can you say greed? can take you down or whatever. Yes, pride. Um, when I, I, everybody knows I was deacon. I think I had a big head because God really ripped me down. He took me out of the church. I got divorced, lost everything. He knocked me down a peg. He said, you are not better than I am. Amen. I'm better than you. And he showed me. And I am so glad he showed me because I got a wonderful wife now. I got a wonderful church. I got wonderful people in the church. And I'm learning a lot more than I ever have. Because God had to knock you down when you get too, like you said, when you get too big mm-hmm. for your riches, God's going to knock you down. Amen. And take things away. Just like Job. When you um, understand God, I guarantee you'll be small in your own sight. Your significance will be, your view of yourself will be totally transformed when you understand God. Any other thoughts tonight before we close with prayer? If you would, stand with me. Father, we thank you for your sweet presence. We thank you, Father, for your faithfulness to us. We thank you for your word and your spirit that speaks into our hearts and into our lives and causes us, Father, to consider ourselves and to consider who we truly are as we look at ourselves from your perspective. And Father, every time that we do, we found ourselves so small so insignificant when we compare ourselves to your glory, to your majesty, 
to your humility. Father, there's a lot of us who think we're humble, who have no idea what true humility even begins to look like. Father, I pray that through the study of the humility of Jesus Christ and the humility of God, that we will have a fresh view, that we will have our eyes anointed and open, Father, to your glory and to what it means to be truly humble. And Father, we would find in that place a new reverence and a new awe for you, a new desire within our hearts, Father, to pour everything out, to present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto you. Father, that we may prove what is that good and perfect and acceptable will that you have for each and every one of us. Father, we know that that living sacrifice that Jesus poured out took him to the cross where he gave his life. Father, we just ask that you would give us the grace that we need to walk that life of living sacrifice, whether it lead to the cross or to the workplace or, Father, wherever it is that you have for us. We just ask, Lord, that you would give us the grace, the wisdom, the discernment to be your sacrifice. We'll give you the praise for all that's accomplished. And Lord, we know that when we surrender our lives and submit our lives in that fashion, that you can then use us and that you can work on hearts and souls and you can speak to lives. So Father, just have your way in each and every one of us. Let all things be done for your glory, for your honor. Father, go with each and every one as they leave here this evening. I pray that you would bless them, that you would encourage them. Father, put your hand of protection upon each and every one and bring us back safely at the appointed time. In Jesus' name I ask, amen.